I'm Ted Seides, and this is Private Equity Deals. This show is an exploration of deals in the private markets. Through conversations with private equity managers, we'll dive into individual deals to learn about deal dynamics, companies, and ownership that make private equity a force in institutional portfolios and the global economy. Season one of Private Equity Deals focused on owners you know. Season two focuses on companies you know. You can keep up to date and join our mailing list at capitalallocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted and podcast guests are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinions of capital allocators or their respective firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Clients of capital allocators or guests may maintain positions in securities or managers discussed on this podcast. On the first episode of season two of Private Equity Deals, Ian Charles and Sam Kennedy discuss Fenway Sports Group. Ian is the founder and managing partner of Arctos Sports Partners, a private equity platform dedicated to the professional sports industry and sports franchise owners. He was a previous guest on Capital Allocators alongside his co-founder, Doc O'Connor, and that conversation is replayed in the feed. Sam is the longtime president and CEO of Arctos portfolio company, Fenway Sports Group. FSG is a 20-year-old global sports, marketing, media, entertainment, and real estate portfolio that has taken cherished and iconic sports clubs to new heights. The business includes ownership of the Boston Red Sox, Liverpool Football Club, and Pittsburgh Penguins, and a series of related real estate and media assets. Our conversation covers Fenway Sports Group holdings, business drivers, and attractiveness as an investment. We discuss Arctos's sourcing, underwriting, and perceived risks of the deal, and then turn to Sam's operating strategy, tuck in acquisition of the Pittsburgh Penguins, importance of fielding winning teams, impact of private institutional capital, capital structure, on-field product, and future plans. Longtime listeners likely know about my affinity for sports, so it's a great privilege to share this discussion of Artosa's investment in FSG with you, and a special bonus to have Sam walking through how it works. Please enjoy my conversation with Ian Charles and Sam Kennedy. Ian, Sam, thanks so much for joining me. Nice to be here. Great to be with you, Ted. Well, Ian, why don't we start and just give a little bit of an elevator pitch on Arctos? Absolutely. Arctos was formed to be the industry's very first provider of growth capital and liquidity solutions to the owners of premium brands, predominantly in North American sports. We raised our fund one about two years ago. That was a $2.2 billion fund, about $3 billion across the fund family. That fund was invested in 17 unique sports franchises and all of their related assets. And we are actively investing our second fund using that same strategy. Great. Well, we're going to talk about Fenway Sports Group. Sam, we'd love to hear what Fenway Sports Group is. Our group started in 2001, believe it or not, when the Yawkey Trust put the sale of the Boston Red Sox and Fenway Park on the Yawkey family had owned the franchise for a long time. And back then, John Henry, Tom Werner, and their group of partners, it was about a group of 15, came together to acquire the assets of the Yawkey Trust. So it started with the Red Sox and Fenway, but John and Tom brought a very entrepreneurial spirit to the organization and encouraged us in the early days to start thinking about growth beyond baseball and beyond the ballpark. And that led us on this journey to invest into NASCAR and ultimately English soccer and more recently the National Hockey League. It's a platform company really designed to focus on winning championships with the teams and clubs that it owns and operates. That's first and foremost, because the business flows and the value creation flows from winning. That is our North Star, winning championships and being involved in markets that have incredibly rabid fan bases that care deeply about their teams and their venues. How do you think about the economics of the business? We've always had a very 
focused approach to winning. So that's required a ton of investment into our sporting operations. So in Boston, player payroll is a huge expense for us. And then fixing up, renovating, building new venues in which we operate. So we have a revenue first mentality here. We're trying to generate as much revenue as possible from every source. And then we've been reinvesting it into the product on the field and into the venues in which we occupy. Fenway Sports Group as a company has great revenues and growth and profitability, but the individual sports team assets have years that are up and down, that are break even, that are cash losses. So I think it really takes a special kind of investor, someone who really has gotten into the space and understands the space to understand where the value creation comes from. And it's not a quarterly look at EBITDA or cash flow. It's really building long-term equity value through investing those revenues back into the product. And Ian has really led the way on that score. Ian, what is it that was attractive to you about Fenway Sports as an asset? Especially as our first investment in our first fund, there couldn't have been a better candidate than Fenway Sports Group. If you take one big step back, when we look at Fenway Sports Group, when we think about this business, it really is a portfolio of a bunch of really important things. You have four leading brands in four different leagues in sports. You have unencumbered ownership of some very, very important live entertainment venues globally. You've got two distinct and very important media platforms in Spring Hill and the New England Sports Network. And you've got a growing real estate and live entertainment footprint really anchored in Boston with one of the most dynamic, acquisitive, and sophisticated management teams and ownership groups in all of sports. And you get all of that in one holding company. That in and of itself is very, very unique. But to give you a sense of scale, how all those things work together at an aggregate level, In any given year, between 40 and 50% of the total revenue in that system is coming from media rights at the international, national, and local level. About 25% is coming from long-term sponsorship contracts. And then between 20 and 25% is coming from ticketing and premium seating and other related activities. That is the same kind of mix of an NFL team or an NBA team, just at a much bigger scale because of the sheer scale of the system. It's an incredible asset for any owner. Sam, how have you thought about the continued growth of these assets over time? We sat down in 2001, 2002 with sort of a strategic plan to get us to where Fenway Sports Group has come, but really we're opportunistic. It was organic growth driven by inquisitive ownership group, especially John and Tom, who had very successful business careers prior to getting involved with FSG. So as we took on private equity partner, which was new for sports and unique for sports and credit to Major League Baseball, I mean, there were many, many, many people who went through Major League Baseball's offices and met with the CFO and the ownership committee before Ian and Doc arrived. And Private equity was not allowed into sports just a couple of years ago. But these guys came in and I remember getting the call from Bob Starkey, the CFO of Major League Baseball. And he said, wow, that group gets it. I said, Ian, Doc, <laughs> come on, come on. And they had a plan and it really was sort of the right time in sports. And you've just seen what's happened. The story, the Arcto story is just incredible. I think we've professionalized our approach to growth, where hopefully we're more disciplined than we were in the past in looking at really blue chip assets that move the needle for our group. We are investing now. Ian mentioned Spring Hill. We've got an amazing partnership with LRMR, with LeBron James and Maverick Carter. We are making some smaller investments, but primarily it's big blue chip assets with great venues and great markets that hopefully need to ramp up the revenue engine, but also the competitive engine on the field, on the pitch, on the ice, on the track. And that's sort of the secret sauce in our business. And we're passionate about it. We absolutely love what we do. 
Sam, what was it about Arctos in this call that you got that you said they got it when others didn't? What did that mean? First of all, it was rooted in relationships. We were introduced to Ian through an existing partner. By the way, when I met him, it's like, I've never met a guy that smart who works out that much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. But Ian came in with this private equity experience. Tom Werner, John Henry, Theo Epstein, Larry Lucchino, our group got to know Doc when he was at CAA. And we take a great deal of pride in connecting these guys together when they were founding. And it was all about the relationships. And I think that the great connection is Ian's background in private equity and everything that he has done and built in his prior life and Doc's amazing background in sports and operating and dealing with owners and leagues. It felt like it was a great marriage. And I think that's resonated with the assets that they've gone after, but also with the leagues that they've had to go seek approval from. That's been the point of differentiation. I think part of your question to Sam, the combination of the backgrounds and skill sets of our team was very different than what I think most ownership groups and most leagues had seen before. But specifically, what most people define as private equity backgrounds, when they say private equity, they mean control leverage buyout funds. And that is not my background. My background is in unlocking market liquidity, being a value-added but passive partner in strategies like secondaries and GP stakes and pref equity. And that background, is actually what the leagues were looking for. Not the control buyout, I'm going to tell everybody what to do, and I'm going to make the decisions, and I'm going to use leverage in financial engineering. We were problem solvers. We had operating experience and industry experience from Doc and the rest of our partners, combined with this market illiquidity experience and skill set. And that was really different. And I think that really unlocked it for us. Half of what we do is providing the minority owners in these sports teams with liquidity, just like my team and I used to provide limited partners with liquidity from their funds or general partners with a little bit of liquidity in their private markets franchise. And so that tactical secondary style of investing and sourcing and deal execution is very, very valuable strategy. Ian, how did this come about? You and Doc got together. You're thinking about buying sports teams, but this situation in particular with FSG, how did you find it and go from there? When we started to talk to Fenway, I think there were about two dozen, maybe a little bit more minority owners in Fenway Sports Group. And there was the original group, but then there have been groups that had come in over time and something left over time. And it was just this organic minority ownership group investing with John, Tom, and Mike, and a very sophisticated family office was interested in partial liquidity. And we had the opportunity to buy a partial stake in Fenway from them, not their entire stake, part of it. And we were able to do what we're really good at, which was design a deal that worked for them, that worked for our fund, and worked for our partners at Fenway, and then grow that partnership over time. We designed a really elegant transaction structure that provided our fund with some really nice downside protection, duration enhancement, and return enhancement. But we were able to get in there and solve that problem quickly, quietly, and navigate the league approvals, which is a very, very difficult thing for a fund to go through for the first time. What was the diligence process like to understand what it was you're owning when there hadn't really been institutional owners in these businesses before? The diligence process here is actually no different than any other direct investment. I mean, all these businesses are audited by a big four auditing firm. They've got board packs because they've got boards. They have lenders. And interestingly, they all go through a second audit. They all get audited by their league. So there's actually a really good second set of books that the league conforms with. And so all of the information that you need to do proper, BD is is there for the taking. The challenge is these are really unique businesses that have shared beta factors, and then they have local execution factors that we think to be done well need to be modeled stochastically and probabilistically. It's a very nerdy way to think about the world. 
when you think about things like when we did this deal, there was this little thing called COVID and there weren't any games. And there was a chance there would be a labor strike in Major League Baseball in a couple of years. And there was a big national TV contract deal coming in Major League Baseball. And to just make a point estimate prediction on how any of those things would turn out, I have a 20-year track record of being disappointed by other managers trying to predict the future. They just can't do it. So when we built this firm, we built it to not think that way. We built it to think probabilistically and model everything probabilistically and think about things probabilistically. Our due diligence process is very, very rigorous, but we're also very aware of the things that we can't possibly predict. And so what we really do is focus in on what are the plausible ranges of outcomes for those inputs and then model them stochastically. So Ian, at least historically, people think of these as trophy assets. How did you come to a price as an institutional buyer that made sense to you? Any asset, you can do an intrinsic value assessment. We used to do this in private equity, used to do real estate, infrastructure, GP stakes. Intrinsic value is actually an unknowable thing the time you're doing the work because you only know the true value once it trades to a buyer and a seller. But what you can do is have a confidence interval around what the likely intrinsic value is. And our job as a value investor, is to buy well below what we think intrinsic value is. That locks in an intrinsic value arbitrage. Geometrically, if you harvest that in a linear way, that is your annualized alpha against that beta stack. So in sports, it's not that hard. Major League Baseball teams trade in a range of valuation multiples that has actually been quite resilient and quite durable and quite consistent for a decade plus. Same thing in NBA teams and NHL teams. You actually have a sense of relative value and intrinsic value in each of these leagues. There's real estate here. That's not that hard to value. There are media assets and media companies here. So in a sum of the parts stack, you can understand a high and a low range of intrinsic value. And then your job is just to come in with structure and with price below that to ensure that intrinsic value arbitrage is locked in. And then it's just a matter of how you harvest it and how you enhance it with value creation over time. When you're going into this, recognizing that you're building a business around buying these types of assets, and these could be nails for which you have a hammer, what were you thinking about the risks of the deal? Clearly the CEO of the Red Sox. (laughs) There were a lot of known unknowns, and I've said some of them already. At the time of this deal, there were no games. There was no vaccine. That was actually really hard. And so we had state by state models that incorporated a lot of data on the ground, whether those states were red, purple, or blue, what the infection rates were. We had probabilistic modeling of what are the odds this quarter that a vaccine gets found? And what is the demand for tickets pre COVID? What could it be post COVID? And we would literally simulate thousands and thousands of future states to figure out when fans might come back to Fenway and Anfield. And in some of those, it was never. They would never come back at full capacity. In some of them, it would happen really fast in less than a year. But on average, it was like three and a half to four years after our entry. That's when fans would come back. The national media deal for Major League Baseball, a huge source of revenue. Would it be a step up? Would it come down? How much of a step up? Understanding the range of outcomes of that variable, very important. Labor lockout with the players union, all of these things, these were big risks that we knew were out there. But at the end of the day, and I'm not trying to make Sam sound smart, it's a hard thing to do. (laughs) We knew we were backing the best management team and ownership group that we could possibly back at the start of the fund. And With all of that uncertainty, the structure of the deal and the management team that we were backing with this portfolio of assets, we knew this was the right deal to start fund loans. It takes a special type of investor, someone who really understands the elements of the investment that Ian was talking about in terms of the intrinsic value, in terms of the arbitrage. I mean, the genius of this whole thing from where I sit is the limited partner entry point 
minority discount. There is a massive premium associated with control of these assets. So I think that is really, really important to think about because we invest heavily in these businesses each and every year in Boston, in Liverpool, in Pittsburgh, in Concord, North Carolina. We want to win. We're here to win championships and put a great product on the field. That doesn't just mean player payroll. That means infrastructure, scouting, analytics, our international operations. A good rule of thumb is we don't like cash losses at the sports teams, but we have them. Some years we're profitable at the team level. Other years we're around break even. And other years we have massive cash losses. COVID, the cash losses were extraordinary for a two-year period. That said, the value, the values of the business, the intrinsic value did not go down. We saw many trades during COVID in the sports business, control trades, LP investments. So the value has held and in fact increased because of the scarcity value, the recurring revenues that are pretty dependent, say for a pandemic. I'd be remiss having you if I didn't ask you about how the economics of some of these businesses within FSG work. The profitability typically comes from outside of the individual team assets. And we have more profit associated with our regional sports network, for example, or our partnership with Maverick and LeBron in our real estate businesses. This is all stuff that's outside of either hockey or baseball or soccer. So it's interesting. If you talk to public market investors, they would probably go away, go invest in something else a lot of the time, because you really need to dive in and look at the value the way that an Arctos does to really understand what's happening inside of these businesses. I don't know, Ian, you can add much better color than I can, but that's what I've noticed. We did talk about a SPAC at one point. We were talking to public market investors, and I don't think the story resonates quite as well. I think especially the assets in the Fenway portfolio, baseball, hockey, EPL, media, they are not correlated much with each other. And they create this very nice diversification benefit. And then when you supplement that with the real estate assets, the media free cash flow, the concert venues, et cetera, you get this really nice baseline free cash flow that can support a year where the Red Sox maybe underperform, even though they have a high payroll. And it really is the synergies of that platform that we haven't really talked about this yet, but when you own multiple assets, when you own real estate, when you're able to generate revenue away from the field, the stadium, the rink, it gives you so much room to move on talent. Really high quality people want to work at a platform like Fenway. It gives you leverage with sponsors in revenue, in costs, and in talent, and in diversification there is benefit to being a platform owner in this industry. It's really unlike most of the industries that I've invested in historically. They're also maintaining as much dry powder as they can because they are opportunistically acquisitive. When they find a premium global brand and have a chance to add it to the portfolio, they're ready. And the business is primed and positioned and has the talent to do it. They're optimizing the business for value creation long-term, but also unexpected near-term scale acquisitions. Because this is kind of a strange industry. The opportunities come when you least expect them. And if you move fast, you've got a shot. Well, Sam, the most recent of those, even since Arctos's investments, was the Pittsburgh Penguins. And we'd love to hear the story of how that came about, how you assessed it and move forward with it. We've long been enthusiastic about the arena business. We obviously have Fenway Park, which is under 40,000, but a big outdoor venue. We've got Anfield over in the United Kingdom, also an outdoor venue. The arena business, given your ability to stage events year round, very attractive, big fans of National Hockey League. We thought that the league and continue to think that there's lots of room for value creation in terms of the multiples that we think will be applied in the future. And so, We would obviously, being located here in Boston and having the connectivity, we have an amazing partnership with the Jacobs family on Nesson, our regional sports network. 
it became clear that the Jacobs had absolutely no interest in selling the Bruins or the Garden, and they've been very committed owners. In fact, stewardship of the team has led to a Stanley Cup, and now the best team in the history of hockey, I think, right now. But that's another story. So a couple years ago, we were reaching out for various NHL and arena opportunities, and I was connected with my counterpart, David Morehouse, who had been the CEO of the Penguins back in 2021. And it was very fortuitous timing. We caught them at a moment where Ron Burkle and Mario Lemieux were interested in a possible control transaction. The deal came together very, very quickly. It's a deal where you have a team that is beloved in the market, amazing venue, right downtown Pittsburgh. They've done a fantastic job. The big concern around the Penguins investment was frankly, because they've done such a great job, is there enough upside here? Can our group add to what has been created there? We'll see. Time will tell. But to Ian's point about people and talent, we've been able to send several of our executives to Pittsburgh in different management roles. We've been able to leverage our relationships with our food and beverage vendor, Aramark, got a great partnership with Oakview Group and Tim Laiwicki on the building management. There's an amazing real estate opportunity. There's control of 28 acres right downtown Pittsburgh adjacent to the venue. So it's very, very early days. But those were the factors, Ted, that led us to invest in the NHL. Well, I think part of their secret sauce, Ted, is just given their pattern recognition, they can see things other people don't see. The first time I met Sam, we did a walk around the stadium. We just sort of get to know each other. He showed me this parking lot. I think trucks delivered food to Fenway or something in this. It's like this weird triangle parking lot, pretty much a worthless, unusable plot of land. And he pointed at that and he said, someday that's going to be the coolest concert venue in Boston. And I was like, okay, baseball guy, sure, whatever. (laughs) And today that is one of the coolest concert venues in the country. It just opened up in partnership with Live Nation and MGM. And that small utilization of a pretty much worthless piece of property that we had right next to Fenway is now going to be generating tremendous free cash flow 52 weeks a year and activating the area around Fenway all year. And just taking that ability to see what other people don't see around these iconic brands and monetize them in really creative, unique ways, that is part of the FSG Secret Sauce. Sam, what do you think are those either synergies or looking around corners that you and your team have grown to understand that others may not when you're looking at assets? It's always about the people, Ted. I mean, we've got a team here that is so passionate, not just about the sport, but about the business of the sport. So taking best practices from around the league, it's a business of relationships and competition on the ice, on the field, on the pitch, we're constantly measuring ourselves every single day against our competition, whether it's your beloved New York Yankees or other teams in the American League East. The same holds true on the business side. We want to make sure we're in the top list in terms of revenue generation. And we're able, because of the platform of Fenway, of what John Henry and Tom Werner and Mike Gordon have built, Ian said it, we can attract amazing talent. I mean, Billy Hogan, our CEO of Liverpool Football Club, started off as an account executive, a salesperson at Fenway Sports Management, our little fledgling sales and marketing agency. Dave Beeston, who works closely with the Arctos team, and Ian, he's now the alternate governor of the Pittsburgh Penguins and managing that asset and doing a great job. So it creates opportunity for people to come into Fenway, learn the business, and then grow and move on to other bigger and better opportunities, but within the platform. I want to just double click into that. One of the things that these guys did that was very smart, probably about a decade ago, is they actually built a commercial enterprise around selling their own inventory around sponsorship, ad placement, et cetera. It's a business called Fenway Sports Management. And what that business has allowed them to do is build the core competencies of commercializing these brands for other brands if other teams want to hire them. But that's created a farm system. There's no pun intended. It's a pipeline of talent of young professionals who know how to sell and monetize and commercialize 
and grow revenue. And that has created a deep bench at Fenway. Dave and Billy, Sam mentioned them, they would be on everybody's shortlist to run their teams. But they get that opportunity at Fenway. And the group behind them knows there's more opportunity coming. And that's a huge competitive advantage that they've built. Sam, you mentioned the importance of winning on the field, on the pitch, on the ice. How important is it to the economics of these businesses? It's everything, Ted. I remember 1993, I was an intern at your beloved New York Yankees, believe it or not. It's where I started my career. And I was assigned immediately to the ticket office to run ticket envelopes back and forth from different departments. And I thought I wanted to go into marketing. And so I asked the head of ticketing, his name was Frank Swain, God rest his soul. I said, Frank, can you show me someday where the marketing department is here? This is at the old Yankee Stadium. He said, yeah, I'll show you right now. Come with me, young man. And he walked me outside of the ticket office, was down in the dungeon at Yankee Stadium. He walked out into the seating bowl. And there was the 1993 Yankees out on the field. He said, look right there, kid. That's the marketing department. (laughs) As they go, we go. And it always stuck with me. I mean, look, we have incredible marketers and creative people and brand people. But at the end of the day, if we're not winning, we're not delivering on our promise for our fans. We're not delivering on our promise for our investors. It drives everything. Winning is number one. And that drives ticketing revenue, sponsorship revenue, food and beverage revenue. It creates a sense of place where acts want to come and have concerts. And it gives you the life and the energy, whether it's around Fenway or Anfield or PPG Paints Arena. You have to have a culture of winning. And I do think John, Tom, and Mike, they all had different careers and built successful businesses. And that's probably the best way to come into sports, but they have a shared passion for winning. We've been at this 21 years together. The focus and the anxiety and the frustration when we're not winning is at an all time high. Right now, this is 21 years, we've won Champions League titles, we've won the league, we've won four World Series. They want to win, first and foremost, and then that drives the business. So another one of our portfolio partners, the Golden State Warriors, has a literally a Hall of Fame executive who just retired, Rick Welps, just an amazing human being. And he said to me once, my job is to build this machine to achieve an attractive level of revenue. But build it in a way so that when we win, we can take it to a whole nother level. Sponsorship, premium, ticketing. And that really resonated with me. It's not about do we win the World Series every year. It's do our fans and does this community, do they believe we're trying to put a superior product and experience on the ice, on the court, on the field? Because then brands want to be associated with it. The Boston Red Sox just signed a 10-year, $170 million patch deal with Mass Mutual, an amazing institution. You don't spend that kind of money associating your brand with a loser. And so winning really does help because people want to be around winning cultures and winning organizations, and they're willing to share their wallet if you do. Sam, as the league allowed institutional private capital to come in, Other than liquidity solutions, how does the availability of private capital change the nature of what you're able to do with the business? Well, it depends on the objectives of the control owners, of course, but certainly the availability of liquidity for LPs is just a massive problem. We talked about it and there was no source for that prior to now. So it's huge. But with groups like ours, We know that we have sophisticated investors sort of at the ready if there's a need for new equity, growth capital, whether it's capital improvements to our venues, our facilities, or making an investment into a new team or a new business or a new opportunity. So that's really powerful. So many of the groups that Arctos is involved with, I mean, you've got the Monumental, Cronky Sports, AEG. These groups that are really expanding and growing, the Ricketts family, you mentioned the Warriors group, and you've seen this trend emerge and grow and develop, and it's exciting for the sports industry, and I think it 
is going to continue to add value because of all the synergy in between the different clubs. I actually think for a guy like Sam, for John, Tom, Mike, and the leadership group, it really opens up two things for you. One, when you do have a chance to add an iconic brand to your platform or initiate a major real estate platform extension, knowing that you have scale institutional capital ready to help you get that done provides a level of confidence, speed, and capability that cannot be matched by the other natural competitors in that process. That's number one. Number two is in every single capital market I've ever experienced in my career and studied before my career, anytime you can show improving liquidity to the natural investors in an asset class, they become more comfortable investing in that asset class. So improving liquidity attracts more capital, which makes it easier to find matches for these LPs that want out, which makes it easier to raise capital for more expansive projects. And it has this flywheel effect that impacts everyone in that ecosystem. So I think institutional capital for each of these leagues in the way that's important to them is really, really important for them as they think about growth over the next decade. And one of the interesting things we've talked about with a deal like this, from your perspective, is that the leagues don't allow financial leverage. And relative to other financial assets, like some of the real estate that's in the portfolio, how do you think about optimal capital structure? That's a great question. And there is no cookie cutter approach in this industry because every single asset is different. Every league is different, but every ownership group is different. The more diverse your platform, the more it moves outside of franchises to include arenas and real estate and free cash flow generating businesses like media companies, that allows you to have a little bit more financial flexibility in your cap structure. So for example, when we were all talking about Fenway's acquisition of the Penguins, they had the ability to draw down at the top co level on a financial revolver to help get that deal done. That flexibility doesn't exist for some clubs because they're constrained to the league rules around leverage. Each of the North American leagues has very strict leverage limitations. Some of them are hard dollar leverage caps, which is kind of unusual, regardless of how big the business is, you're 350 million or 500 million. Other leagues have an EBITDA test or an LTV test, but this industry is very, very immune to a lot of leverage. They just don't want any kind of liquidity squeeze impacting the ecosystem. And so they just don't let you do it. Sam, without that financial risk, we're past COVID now, not that we can't have another call it work stoppage in sports, God forbid. What do you see as the biggest risks to these businesses not continuing to grow, not having that next media rights deal increase? Great question. And we spend a lot of time thinking about it, worrying about it. I think the biggest risks that we face, there's this sort of, you get existential threats like COVID or a terrorist attack, you know, we worry about that. But boy, I cannot think of a worse thing than a global pandemic when you're in the public gathering business, serving food and beverage. I think we've lived through one of the most horrific things we can encounter. And we saw what it did to our industry and we saw what happened with valuations. So where I think we have to make sure we're not resting on our laurels is the product. And what I mean by that, how is the game played? What's the consumer experience? What does the modern consumer want with a shortened attention span, with so many more choices? So making sure that baseball is the best version of itself. Ice hockey, same thing. Soccer, global soccer, same thing. And ferociously paying attention to the product on the field. I'm so excited about the changes that Commissioner Manfred and Arctos Special Advisor Theo Epstein and our chairman Tom Werner worked on to have a new brand of baseball, which is going to be really, really exciting. And I think that's representative of that concern and focusing on the product itself. So we keep our consumers and our fan bases as rabid as they've ever been before. I'd love to ask you about European football or soccer in that lens. 
How does a league like that think about improving the experience for the fans when it's already so popular? Well, soccer is called the beautiful game for a reason. It's hard to mess with a masterpiece. And you've seen change come a little bit more slowly into global football. But it's amazing to me. We invested in 2010. And the difference between the popularity and the attraction to global football in the United States, for example, 350 million people, whatever we are, is extraordinary. NBC did a great job, and now new rights holders have come along. The game lends itself beautifully to two hours, 15 minutes, constant action. Now, as an American, I used to say, oh, soccer's boring. I didn't understand it at all. You watch it, you get into it, you become addicted to it. There's constant action. It's fast pace, unbelievable athleticism. When a goal happens, it's an extraordinary moment and you realize how much goes into it and how it gets set up. There are people far more qualified than me to talk about ways to either improve or enhance football because I'm still learning the sport. I'm a baseball guy. But it is really remarkable how it lends itself to a younger audience, the next generation of fans, and just the global passion for it's extraordinary. The league has not had a lot of the same focus that we've had in football, hockey, basketball, baseball on this attention on the product. And it's a great question. I think the tradition and how the sport has evolved works really well in today's society. So it's really interesting. What are the things that you would like to be doing or are working on within the business that you haven't accomplished yet? With Fenway Sports Group, we really are driven by trying to improve on the field first and foremost. But if I take a step back from the day-to-day job of operating the club, it's really working with our partners and thinking about what's next. I mean, that's what gets us excited. We have a very highly charged growth mindset. We also are always concerned about buying right, making sure if you're going to buy an asset, you're buying it at the right price. We've been together 21 years, and we've only made eight. 10 acquisitions. I think we've been disciplined. We are very excited about the possibility in other global sports, domestic sports here in the United States. We've been public about our fondness for the NBA, the NFL. It's interesting, the NFL, unless I'm mistaken, they still do not allow institutional capital, probably for good reason. Maybe they felt they don't need it, but I think that day is coming. So it'll be interesting to see what new opportunities might lie ahead for Fenway Sports Group down the road as the rules continue to change in these different leagues. Ian, from a single deal perspective, Sam mentioned what was a very popular word about two years ago, SPAC. How do you think about exit strategy on something like FSG? We think about it in some very complex and creative ways, but probabilistically, we know this is a growth-oriented organization and ownership group. We also know that that growth is going to require pretty significant amounts of capital, especially if they want to grow into the NBA and into the NFL. Those are mega cap ticket prices. It is also no secret, it is in the public domain that the ownership group has hired advisors to explore possibilities of monetizing Liverpool Football Club. I think Goldman and Morgan Stanley were advising Fenway in that. And so whether it's through the monetization of one of the underlying assets over time, monetization of the whole platform in a strategic but very accretive transaction at cold code level, or over time, monetizing our position through a sponsor-to-sponsor trade, a secondary transaction, our own manufactured liquidity. We have many, many paths to liquidity when we're ready to begin that harvesting. But if the leadership team at Fenway decides that the right opportunity exists to monetize the platform or an underlying asset, that's well ahead of our base case timeline and very accretive to our expected return profile. Sam, after a successful ownership period, there is this possibility of a transaction to sell Liverpool. And we'd love to hear your thought process of the disposition of an asset within FSG. 
Oh, I can't wait to see Sam tap dance around this one. That's going to be good. <laughs> and you've finally touched on a subject that I am not at liberty to discuss other than just to reinforce what Ian said. We did a while back engage investment banks. We've been public about that. We've been open about the willingness to potentially take on investment into the club. Will it happen or not? I don't know. But we share a common vision with all of our partners, and that is long term. I mean, John and Tom have been at this 21 years, and you would think they'd been at it 21 days. I mean, they are enthusiastic, excited about everything at Fenway Sports Group and think about what's next. So that's my tap dancing around the Liverpool question. We do focus a lot because Billy Hogan grew up here on ways that we can help increase revenues and the growth we've seen and our financials are actually public over in Liverpool, the growth has been extraordinary. And I think that's because markets like the United States are just sort of catching on to the excitement around this league. So anyway, we'll see what the future brings for Liverpool, but it's been an amazing, amazing business. So post COVID, which we know is a big one, what are some of the day-to-day, year-to-year bumps in the road in and around these businesses? Well, with us, it's usually the competitiveness or lack thereof. And you get a delayed effect from that. So we had a down year in 22. Aaron Judge went out and decided that he was Roger Maris. And you have that negative halo effect or positive halo effect in 2023. 2021, we were two games from going to the World Series after kicking the Yankees' ass in a one-game playoff. Wow. Had to bring that up. (laughs) (laughs) It really is around the competitiveness because the businesses can be choppy when you're in a down period on the field and it can grow very quickly. For example, one question we face every year with our different businesses, do we budget for postseason play? For example, in our projections and our financials, and I'm very superstitious. So we don't, we don't anticipate making the postseason in our financials, but we absolutely anticipate making the postseason in our operating plan each and every year. So that really drives a lot of the financials. Ian, I'd love to hear what have you learned over the last couple of years from this investment in coloring your perspective on investing in the industry? What haven't I learned, Sam? I was mispronouncing European soccer leagues for the first 18 months of this thing. What's actually been amazing to me is how similar these businesses are to a lot of other businesses. They have long-term, highly contracted revenues, depending on the team and the league, that can be 50 to 80% of the total revenue stack. They have a protected margin, which is actually very unusual. The leagues have sort of a collar spend that you're not allowed to move. But another way to say that is they have a protected gross margin. And they have this protected gross margin over a long horizon where they've grown revenue by about three and a half X. So you have this predictable profitability, this very stable, underwritable revenue stream. And at the end of the day, it comes down to the vision, the leadership, and the execution capabilities at two levels, at the club level, and Fenway has many clubs, but also at the league level. Fenway is partnered with some very, very sophisticated business operators. They just happen to run Major League Baseball and the National Hockey League and the EPL. And some of our partners are great operators in their markets, but they're also partnered with the NBA and Major League Soccer and hopefully someday the NFL. So you're actually, when you make one of these investments, the portfolio effect is really beautiful, but you're actually partnering with two different management teams that are partners in and of themselves. It's really surprising to me how much the business side of these very competitive brands interact, help each other and support each other because they're actually not allowed to compete with each other for money. They're not allowed to take each other's sponsorship pop. They're not allowed to compete with each other for tickets in their local markets. And so they actually share best practices. Now, we play a really important role in pulling all of our leadership teams together across leagues and letting them share best practices. That's a really cool thing that we do. But probably the most surprising thing to me is how this business is actually not that different from a lot of other businesses that our team's been an investor in. 
But I'd love to ask you both my last closing question for completely different perspectives. That question, and we could start with you, Sam, is what's your favorite aspect of private equity? Well, you asked Ian what he's learned. I have learned so much, just enough to be dangerous about private equity. The first thing I learned is I probably should have gone to work in private equity, and then maybe I could have become an investor in sports instead of an uh, operator. And I will encourage my son and his generation to consider it as a career. What I love about private equity, what I've gotten to learn, is the people aspect of it, the management teams. I mean, I can't imagine in docs day to day. Obviously, they have to raise all this money from institutions, but then each and every day they're working with people like the Fenway Sports Group management. And then you multiply that out across an industry, which we're all very passionate about. It's just an incredible thing to be able to learn from people in different markets, different skill sets, different experiences, the ownership groups. I mean, you're talking about some of the best business people in the history of mankind who have the net worth to be able to afford these assets to begin with. And that's who the Arctos crew is interacting with. So I've learned that the people really matter and that's rewarding because I've always sort of believed that inherently, but to see it manifest itself and play out that these guys make investments, they back the right groups and the back people because they are long-term and they really believe in the management teams. So that's been terrific. And it's also been great to see from a league perspective that this thesis about allowing institutional capital in. It sounds sort of arrogant now when you think about it, but there was just a concern because these clubs are so important. They mean so much to their communities. And the Hippocratic Oath of do no harm really applies here. So to see it come to fruition from the beginning and work and solve a problem and see continued value creation, it's been rewarding and educational. And frankly, Last thing I'll say is the partnership with private equity has been really rewarding for our team, for our people, for the management, because they've really enjoyed learning about private equity and what goes into it and what's important to them. I think the most motivating thing you can have when you go to work every single day is to feel like you're continuing to learn and to grow. And that's certainly been true of our exposure to the private equity industry. That's great. Ian, how about you? What's your favorite aspect of private equity? I don't want to sound like I'm parroting Sam, but the thing that I love about private equity is some of the amazing people you get to interact with. It's the people side of the business. I love math and I'm nerdy and I love all of that structural stuff, but I also love good people. If you're a good human being and you want to better yourself and be a better person, be a better colleague and be a part of a vision, be a part of building something really special. You get to spend time with people like that in this industry. And what's awesome is half the people you work with, they're already better than you. You get to learn from young people and old I mean, like Doc served in World War I. I get to hear all of his stories. But at the same time, I learn from our senior associates every day. And just interacting with all of the people that I've had a chance to work with throughout my career, that's been a gift to me from this industry. It's just been something I'm so grateful for. All the incredible you know, managing partners of this and heads of IR of that and head of private markets over here and CIO over there, but also everybody else that's doing the grind in, that's trying to be better and learn a little bit more and do a little bit better for firefighters and police officers and scholarships and retirees. We spend a lot of time here. I know this sounds really silly. We actually spend a lot of time here talking about who our investors are, because I want to make sure everybody here knows in their own little way, they have a chance to make a really small difference in some really, really important things all over the world. And there are not a lot of industries that give you that chance. That's what I love about the asset class. Sam, Ian, so much fun. Thanks for sharing this story and best of luck and continued success at FSG. Thanks so much, Ted. Great to be with you. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ted. Awesome. All right, buddy. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.